Well, good afternoon, everybody. For a fleeting moment, I thought you were all here to see me. <laughs> no, huh? Okay. Well, thank you. It's great to see everybody here. Um, before introducing our guest speaker, please note the various issues that are being flashed before you on the screen. It's my enormous pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Jennifer Doudna. As I'm sure you all know, <laughs> Dr. Doudna has made many seminal discoveries, including the solution of the first X-ray-based structure of catalytic RNA, and more recently, of course, Dr. Doudna is the co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020 with her colleague, Dr. Emmanuel Charpentier. Their landmark research on RNA biology led to the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 as a tool for making highly targeted changes to the genome. Dr. Doudna is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, holds multiple highly prestigious positions within the University of California system. Her lab currently focuses on discovering and determining the mechanisms of novel CRISPR-Cas and associated proteins, developing genome editing tools for use in vitro, in plants, and in mammals, and developing anti-CRISPR agents. Her research is at the cutting edge of revealing a technology that has widespread use in many areas of biomedical research, diagnostic platforms, and has significant clinical applications against cancer and other genetic diseases. In addition to her many scientific achievements and honors, Dr. Doudna is the founder of the Women in Enterprising Science Program at IGI UC Berkeley. Today's lecture will explore the future of CRISPR, what's ahead for genome editing. Thank you all for joining us. Please welcome Dr. Doudna. Very warm introduction. It's a great pleasure to be back at NIH. So wonderful to see all of you here. I'm excited to be here and to have a chance to talk with you about some of our research. And I thought what I would do today is I want to talk a little bit about the future of CRISPR, but I really want to tell you what we're actively working on in the lab right now, because I think that's always the most immediate fun science to discuss. So I'll tell you about two of the things that we're doing that will help advance a field that has really grown amazingly over the last decade. And I'll just start by pointing out that, um, that we got started working in this field by studying a very fundamental question in biology, namely how bacteria fight viral infection. I'm an, I'm an RNA biochemist and sometimes structural biologist, and I got into this because of work that a colleague of mine at Berkeley was doing showing that bacteria had an adaptive immune system, a way they could use RNA molecules to protect cells from future infection. So we got fascinated to try to understand the, the biochemistry and mechanism behind this. And that led to a discovery about the RNA-guided proteins that are responsible for this immune system. Two of them are shown here. And oops, let me go back one. Um, well, that's interesting. It's very touchy. If you could go back one slide, please. I just want to point out CRISPR-Cas9 and Cas12 are two of the enzymes that use an RNA guide in bacteria to find matching DNA sequences and generate a double-stranded break. And today, there are large families of these. There are more being discovered all the time. So we know that these types of proteins are widespread in prokaryotic cells where they provide mostly, we think, protection against infection or plasmid transformation. And amazingly, they can also be harnessed as technologies for manipulating genomes. And that's something that we've been working on now for over 10 years. And what's quite exciting is that just in December of this past year, there was the first FDA approval of a CRISPR therapy. This is a therapy for a disease called sickle cell disease. And um, this is a picture of Victoria Gray, who was the first U.S. patient to receive a CRISPR therapy for her sickle cell disease. 
when she was first uh, treated on the left, and then on the right-hand side, a picture taken about a year ago when she was at that time about four years out from that treatment. And what's extraordinary about this type of therapy is that it's ideally a one-and-done treatment that can correct a disease-causing mutation, or in the case of sickle cell disease, override the effect of a genetic mutation. So this is incredibly motivating. And yet, uh, what's really interesting is that we're still, I, I think, at the very beginning of this field and what will be possible with CRISPR. So one of the things that's very interesting about this approved therapy is that it uses the very same CRISPR-Cas protein that we call SPI-Cas9 based on its bacterial origin that Emmanuel Charpentier and I started studying back in 2011. And so this enzyme has proved to be a very robust uh, editor of genomes. And um, there's many more uh, enzymes out there, but this one still uh, is one of the very best for manipulating genomes for reasons that we're still working to, to understand. In addition to the excitement around this therapy, however, we have to grapple with the challenges that include the cost and the, the uh, difficulty of delivering CRISPR into patients. Right now, this is a disease that requires bone marrow transplantation of edited cells that are edited in the laboratory. So we are very excited and imagine a day when that won't be necessary and it could be possible to deliver the CRISPR genome editors directly into patients. So what I want to talk about today is how we're thinking about this as biochemists and the way that we're approaching the, the challenges of reducing the cost of a therapy like this so that we can have uh, treatments that could be much more widely available, ultimately globally. So I'm going to really talk about two things. I want to talk to you about this question of whether editors like Cas9 can actually be improved. And then I also want to address this challenge of how we ultimately can deliver these kinds of editors in vivo directly into the cells that need editing in the body. A big challenge, but also extremely interesting uh, biology that's involved. So I'm going to start by talking about the improvement of editors. And, and that might sound a little bit uh, strange, given that, that uh, clearly these, these types of, of systems are already effective enough to be useful clinically. But it turns out that there's a, a, a number of barriers to using them in the in medical applications that include the cost of producing these molecules and associated risks that come about due to the maintenance of proteins for a long period of time in cells that might end up triggering undesirable genome edits. So these are some of the things that are motivating the work that we're doing to try to find editors that might be even better for various reasons, especially for clinical use. And so when we started this work, uh, this actually goes back now a few years in my lab to thinking about proteins that are, um, might be very useful in the body for reasons that have more to do with their physical or chemical properties, including thermostability. And so we started working on a protein from a, a, a thermophilic bacterium that's closely related to other Cas9 enzymes, but it has the, uh, the uh, potential advantage of coming from a, ther a, a, a thermophilic organism. And so I'm showing you here, here a picture, this is actually a homology model, of the protein we call GEO, Cas9, an enzyme that has a very similar structure to the uh, other Cas9 proteins that have been studied. So it has a kind of a classic clamshell shape that holds on to the RNA guide. And these proteins work by using their RNA guide to interrogate DNA in any context, but in particular in, in a genome, and identify sequences that match the RNA guide shown in that little cartoon there on the right-hand side with a 20 nucleotide sequence in the RNA guide that can interact with DNA, allowing the protein to unwind the DNA locally and generate a double-stranded DNA break. And one of the things that's important about these proteins is that they require not only that target recognition sequence, but they also require a short motif that we call the PAM sequence adjacent to the target site. And that PAM sequence is anywhere from two to five base pairs typically in length, but that's a critical element of the DNA unwinding that's required for recognition. So this is an enzyme that carries out uh, this type of activity, 
and has a very similar molecular architecture. And yet, um, it turns out that it's, uh, oh, if you could go back somehow, I don't know if I'm too uh, fast on the clicker here, but um, so, it, so uh, I wanted to show you a couple of the properties of this protein that were initially attractive to us when we started studying. And us really here is, uh, is Lucas Harrington, who was a graduate student in my lab back in uh, 2016, 2017. So he found that when he tested this protein biochemically, GeoCas9 had a higher uh, thermostability than what we saw for our, our favorite enzyme, the spy Cas9 protein. So that seemed interesting. And we also found that because perhaps of its thermostability, it was highly stable in the presence of um, serum, which is an experiment shown down on the bottom, where if we incubate these enzymes in the presence of human serum, we found that the spy Cas9 enzyme loses activity almost immediately, whereas the GeoCas9 thermostable enzyme could tolerate the presence of, of human plasma in these biochemical reactions, giving us hope that these, this protein might actually have some properties useful as a, uh, as a tool. We also found something very interesting, which was that uh, the GeoCas9 enzyme seemed much less prone to aggregation than what we had observed with the SpyCas9 enzyme. I don't know if you can see this here, but this is an experiment done with neural progenitor cells where we were looking at pre-assembled Cas9 protein RNA complexes, which we can apply directly to cells and use to induce genome edits. And we found that we observed a lot of aggregation of these RNP ribonucleoprotein samples with the spy Cas9 protein that we didn't see with GeoCas9, which is the sample in the middle. And so again, we thought this looked uh, like a, a good property that one might want for a, a useful tool for manipulating cells in a clinical setting. And yet, uh, it turns out that the GeoCas9 enzyme is a really lousy genome editor. And so I'm showing you here an experiment. This is kind of a, a classic experiment that, that we do in the lab where we can look at genome editing indicated by the expression of a reporter protein called TD tomato. So we take cells that are derived from a mouse engineered with this reporter protein that's behind a series of stop codons that can be edited out with an editor like Cas9. And if we get editing, we can observe cells that turn red due to expression of TD tomato reporter uh, protein. So you can see very clearly that the spy Cas9 enzyme, when we do this type of experiment, delivers, uh, is delivered into these cells very efficiently. We get a lot of editing, and cells turn red. But with this GeoCas9 thermostable enzyme, we saw almost uh, no red cells. And so this was very disappointing initially to, to the student working on this project because uh, you know, it looked like we had something very interesting in terms of its physical and chemical behavior, and yet biochemically, and, and biologically, it really looked like a, a, a lousy editor. So we had sort of put this project on the shelf for, for several years. And then um, uh, recently, a postdoctoral scientist, Kai Shen, came to my lab with a background in protein engineering. And he decided to start asking why this protein might be a lousy editor and whether there were things that we could do to make it better while maintaining the properties about its stability that we liked. And so he set up a system that's shown here using a bacterial selection scheme to try to identify enzymes that would be more effective and perhaps potentially better uh, genome editors in this type of a setting. And so the assay works by providing bacteria with two plasmids, one of which encodes the Cas9 enzyme and its RNA guide, and the other plasmid encodes a toxin that's the target of the guide RNAs in the, in the experiment. And so then by introducing mutations into the GeoCas9 gene, we can select for proteins that have higher levels of activity pro by providing more uh, uh, cleavage of the toxin gene and better survival of, plasma, of, uh, of bacteria in the selection. And so this is set up in a way that allows us to go from proteins that initially have very, very low activity to enzymes that have robust or improved activity and uh, we did this by, we found we had to actually use a, 
a non-cognate PAM sequence in the DNA so that we could encourage enzymes that would have, uh, you know, uh, mutations and activities exploring different areas of the structural space than what you find in the natural enzyme. And by doing that, we actually found proteins that were a lot more active than uh, the wild-type protein, at least in this bacterial system. So if I could go back one. Right, and so this is just showing on the left a series of these uh, different st stages in the selection cycle where you can um, pull out mutants at uh, different points and sequence them so we could kind of identify what kinds of mutations were coming up and also to test whether we were maintaining a property of this enzyme that we thought would be fundamental, which is its thermostability. And amazingly, even at the very end of going through several rounds of selection, we ended up with a protein that had very similar thermostability to the original enzyme and was certainly a lot more stable uh, compared to the, the uh, SPI Cas9 enzyme, which is kind of our benchmark. And the question was, yes, but would this be uh, superior as a genome editor? And so I want to show you, first of all, um, the positions where this is just a chart that, oh, sorry, everyone, this is kind of very touchy. Um, well, if I can't go back, it's okay. But this is, this is really showing, so I'll, I'll show you later the, where these mutations occur in the enzyme. But Kai Chen first wanted to just ask, do we have better uh, genome editing with this evolved version of the, the uh, GeoCas9 enzyme? And I just want you to notice, so these are experiments done with a series of different guide RNAs, uh, different PAM sequences that were the target uh, the adjacent to the target site in uh, a DNA uh, uh, sequence that was being targeted in each case. And each set of data are showing you a series of enzymes, starting with the original wild-type GeoCas9, where you see in almost every case there's extremely low or mostly no detectable genome editing. And moving across, as we went through the rounds of selection in this type of experiment, to ultimately enzymes that turn out to be, in many cases, very robust uh, as genome editors. So this was really very exciting to see that. And I think the next slide shows just some additional uh, data there. That's okay. We don't need to go back to it. Um, but overall, about a, a several thousand-fold increase in uh, the level of editing that we observed on average with this enzyme. So clearly a much, much better uh, genome editor. And so uh, for, for, a, you know, for a protein engineer, this was great, and he was very excited. Kai was very excited about using this in experiments. But of course, for me as a biochemist, I want to know why. Why is this enzyme better? And so this is where he teamed up with a student in my lab, Amy Eggers, to really dig into the details and try to understand what might have changed in the enzyme to make it a much better uh, editor in cells. So that was the question. Why, why is it a more active genome editor? And I'm just going to show you a few of the experiments that Amy did to try to dissect this. And uh, so the first thing that we asked was, um, uh, I showed you this before, but basically we, we recognized that this improved GeoCas9 protein has much lower specificity for a particular PAM sequence. And that was sort of by design with the way we set up the, uh, the selection um, assay, and that's demonstrated here in individual experiments. We also found that uh, the enzyme has, has a markedly reduced requirement for magnesium ions. So this was something that Amy had wondered about because um, in thinking about the difference between bacterial cells where these enzymes are originally evolving and the environment in mammalian or human cells where we're conducting genome editing experiments, the level of free magnesium ion is quite different. And so she did a biochemical experiment to test whether free magnesium would affect the behavior of these proteins. And she got a really interesting result. So testing these proteins at 5 millimolar magnesium chloride activities looked very similar. She started to drop down the uh, level of magnesium ion, however, and she found that when she got down to very low levels, 0.01 millimolar magnesium, uh, in these reactions, we saw virtually no activity from the wild-type uh, protein, but still fairly robust activity from this improved or evolved uh, version of GeoCas9. 
And so that was one clue that this is an enzyme that has now reduced its requirement naturally for magnesium ion, and so has the ability potentially to work better in cells where the free magnesium is reduced. And it's kind of, kind of curious to think that we did the selection in cells that have higher magnesium available. So there was something that had happened in the evolution of this enzyme that reduced its requirement for magnesium. So this led us to doing some structural biology. And I'm just going to briefly uh, summarize here to tell you that using cryoelectron microscopy, Amy and several colleagues, including Owen Tuck and Kasha Soksek, were able to determine structures of this geoenzyme, both in the wild type case, so the starting point for the, this selection experiment, and then the improved version that we got at the other end. And overall, these proteins look very similar. They have the same kind of clamshell, classic shape of Cas9. They have the RNA guide bound. These are both structures determined with bound RNA in a, what we call the R-loop formation. So the, R, the DNA is unwound and the, the guide RNA is engaged. And then what was very interesting was to zoom in on where the mutations are that occur in this improved version of the enzyme. And I think I have a chart that should uh, show this, yeah. So this is now on the left-hand side showing these different lineages of selections that were done in bacteria. And you don't have to pay attention to the details of these mutations that emerge, but I just want to point out that in that what we found was that in the most evolved versions of the enzyme that had the most robust uh, genome act editing activity by far, we found a convergence of three mutations that occurred in a kind of an unexpected part of the protein called the wedge domain that is a, a region of Cas9 that's been mostly ignored in the field, by, including by us. It's a, it's a place in the protein that I'll show you momentarily that literally sits in between where the guide RNA is located, its major binding site in the protein, and where DNA unwinding occurs and RNA engagement with the DNA. So that was quite intriguing. And so that led us to investigate more closely in the structure what these mutations might actually be doing. And I want to show, I think I have a video on the next slide that shows um, a, an animation of this the structure. And if you could just play the, the, the um, animation, please. So here you're looking at the GeoCas9 enzyme. The wedge domain is in green, and in red are the three key mutations that occur. And you can see they sort of trace out a surface that interacts with the nucleic acid right at this position where the RNA is engaging with the double-stranded DNA, which is on the left-hand side. And I don't know why, the, uh, why it's not um, playing for you, but uh, even if it doesn't play, I will, I'll just describe, here we go, that these mutations are, occur at positions that, where we see increased charge that gets introduced by the three mutations that we think actually helps this enzyme to engage more uh, strongly with the nucleic acid, maybe bind it more tightly. But more than that, actually, we think, really help with DNA unwinding. And or at least this was the hypothesis, was that these, these uh, positions in the protein unexpectedly have a role, perhaps, in allowing enzymes like this to use an RNA guide and an RNA mechanism to unwind DNA and allow engagement with a target site like this. So uh, we wanted to really test this. And yeah, this is just a close up here. And I just wanted to point out that the positions where these mutations in the, in the enzyme interact with the nucleic acid are shown in, uh, in that little cartoon on the right where the arrows are pointing. So they're not right in the R-loop region with the DNA. They're just next door to it in a place where we have a lot of data from other experiments and using our, our spy Cas9 enzyme where we can show that, that those engagements at that position in the DNA are critical for DNA unwinding. And I didn't mention this before, but one of the things that's fascinating about these types of proteins is that they unwind DNA without requiring ATP hydrolysis. So it's, a, it's a, an unwinding that has to involve structural changes in the protein, as well as the thermodynamics of RNA binding to DNA, we think, that are responsible for that, that unwinding, which is so critical for the activity of all of these types of proteins. So I want to show you an experiment that Amy did to ask the question, whether, ask whether these mutations in the evolved or improved version of GeoCas9 are, in fact, 
helping with this DNA unwinding process. And to do that, she had help from a um, postdoc in the lab, Erin Doherty, who uh, helps her set up an experiment where we used a, a fluorescent version of a nucleotide called 2-aminopurine that can be positioned in a DNA substrate at places along a sequence like this in such a way that uh, we take advantage of natural fluorescence of the nucleotide. This, fluor this nucleotide, 2-aminopurine, is quenched. Its, uh, its fluorescence is quenched when it's in a, a duplex and it's base paired, but when it unwinds in a single-stranded form, it's now fluorescent. And so this was the experiment that Amy did with Aaron, was to put two amino purines at positions along a DNA substrate for this GeoCas9 enzyme that would be adjacent to, in the middle, or at the distal end from where those mutations in the protein are engaging with the DNA helix. And the idea was to ask, using this fluorescence assay, what the rate of DNA unwinding is with the enzyme. And so I'll show you the data, and what was really exciting to see is that, in fact, these wedge domain mutations in the improved GeoCas9 have a profound effect on the rate of DNA unwinding. So I'll just show the data here and note that we're, again, working at a very low concentration of magnesium ions so that we can really distinguish between the behaviors of the wild-type GeoCas9, the starting enzyme that's a lousy editor, and this improved GeoCas9 that's a very good uh, genome editor. And so if you look on the left-hand side, when we look at two amino purines placed immediately adjacent to where those wedge domain interactions occur, we don't see really any difference in the behavior of the DNA and the unwinding of, uh, of DNA in interacting with these enzymes. However, if the two amino purine is in the middle, or especially if it's at the distal end in the DNA with respect to where that DNA unwinding initiates, we find a very profound difference in the rate of unwinding. And so we really think that this is evidence that these wedge domain mutations play an important role in allowing the enzyme to open up DNA. And that's critical because the way genome editors work, the way these enzymes work, if they're in a cell and they have to find a target site in a genome, is they have to search many, many potential binding sites to find a true interaction site that matches the sequence of the guide RNA and leads to productive engagement with the template. Okay. Um, right, and so I just want to show you one more experiment. So then we said, all right, if we really understand how, if we really have identified mutations in Cas9 that are valuable for DNA unwinding, maybe that can improve the activity of another related enzyme that's also known to be a good DNA cleaver, but not a very good genome editor. And that's a protein called the NME2Cas9. And so we looked in that enzyme, and, and what's very nice is that structurally, these uh, proteins, the GeoCas9 enzyme and the NME protein, are quite closely related. So it was possible to identify sites in the wedge domain of this NME enzyme that would be very similar to the positions in the GeoCas9 enzyme and make uh, similar mutations at those sites. So we did that experiment, and Kai Chen then tested these NME Cas9 mutants for their genome editing activity. And we found that uh, these proteins were, in fact, much, much better in almost every case. So these are, again, looking at experiments where we test, in this case, we're testing the knockdown of a gene uh, GFP that's, that's uh, integrated in the genome of these cells, and we can look at different guide RNAs that target that gene. And you can see that in virtually every case, the wild-type version of the enzyme is a very poor editor, but the, the uh, version containing wedge domain mutations becomes now a much more robust uh, genome editor. And so we think that this combination of mutations in the enzyme and also the um, reduced requirement for magnesium ions has, has made it possible for an enzyme that started off as a very lousy genome editor to now become much more robust at DNA unwinding and capable of acting under conditions that are found preferentially in mammalian cells, namely low magnesium ion concentrations that make this enzyme much better. Now, why do we care? Why are we, why are we doing all of this? Well, we think, first of all, we fundamentally want to understand how these types of proteins work and how they find target sites and do chemistry. 
But ultimately, when we think about applying these types of enzymes for uh, clinical use, having enzymes that are robust, stable, uh, very active at very low concentrations will be critical for reducing the amount of enzyme that you need to use in the clinic and also for improving the, the uh, specificity and the kinds of editing uh, efficiencies that we can observe over time in cells. So that's one very strong motivation for this work that we're uh, always thinking about as we continue to explore the fundamental uh, biochemistry of these types of enzymes. But again, even if we have a great genome editor, we still have to get it into cells. And so I want to turn next to this question of how we can actually deliver enzymes like this in the body. So how editing enzymes can actually be delivered in vivo. I think that this is really the forefront of the field right now. It's so exciting to see an approved therapy using CRISPR-Cas9, and yet we can appreciate that most patients that could benefit from it right now can't get access because of the cost or because of the requirement for hospitalization to go through a bone marrow transplant. What if we have a, a mechanism for delivery that could allow us to put these kinds of editing enzymes safely and efficiently into just those cells of the body where they could have a clinical benefit. It would be transformative. So we're very excited to think about how we can do this. And again, I've always got my biochemical hat on and sort of asking how we can think about this from a mechanistic perspective. So I want to share with you some of the experiments we have ongoing in the lab to explore this. And um, you'll see that it's very much a work in progress, but I think it points in a direction that is uh, very promising. So in general, we've been thinking about ways for, uh, of delivering these editors, particularly in a non-viral form. And I like this because I, I think that if we can put directly assembled protein guide RNA complexes into cells without requiring uh, delivery through a, a viral encoded system, we're going to have a safer mechanism of genome editing because we can control the amount of editor in the cell at any given time. And if we know the lifetime of these types of assembled ribonucleoproteins in the cell, which we often do for these, or you can, we can measure it, then we have a very defined window in which editing will occur, after which these enzymes will be naturally degraded and, and be gone. So a few years ago, Jenny Hamilton, a former postdoc of ours, came to the lab and uh, wanted to explore the idea of delivering pre-assembled ribonucleoproteins, but using a viral-type mechanism. And the idea was to essentially take the machinery of a virus, in this case a lentivirus, and use it to carry in the cargo that we could engineer, namely pre-assembled Cas9 RNA guides, and potentially also templates for DNA recombination at some point. But using the, the molecular strategy of the virus for cell targeting and cell transduction. So that was the idea. And so I'm going to summarize the work that she did over the next few years to explore this. And so we ended up uh, working on this and, and um, as I'll show you, coming up with particles that are virally derived but they're not viruses. So to distinguish these from a viral delivery mechanism, we began calling these enveloped delivery vehicles, or EDVs, because they are enveloped like a virus. Uh, they, have, they have molecular machinery on the surface that can recognize cell surface markers on target cells, but they're not infectious, and they don't carry a, a viral genome, and they don't carry a, a genome that's encoding Cas9. Cas9 is, the, is uh, the protein, is the cargo directly. And so the way this is done is by making a fusion enzyme, a fusion protein, between a protein called GAG, which is naturally a part of the lentiviral uh, assembly mechanism, and the CRISPR-Cas9 enzyme. And so this is done uh, to allow assembly of the particle, and it will naturally recruit the Cas9 protein because it's part of this GAG fusion. And then we had uh, engineered originally a protease cleavage site so that the Cas9 protein, with its RNA guide already added, could be released inside these particles and then delivered into cells. So that was the idea. And furthermore, we wanted to make sure that we could ultimately control 
where these types of particles would go, what kinds of cells they would actually transduce and deliver their cargo to. And so to do that, Jenny has uh, started using particles like uh, cartooned here, where we have two types of molecules displayed on the surface. One is a fusogen, shown in gold, that is a mutated form of a well-known fusogen called VSDG that's capable of cellular transduction, uh, so it can actually fuse with cells and deliver cargo, but it has uh, lost its ability to bind to a particular cell surface marker. And to get that specificity, what Jenny did was to display on the surface single-chain antibody fragments, single-chain FEs, that were able to recognize a particular cell surface marker. I won't show you all of the data for this. Um, the, the papers, or some of these papers uh, have been published or, and are on BioArchive if you're curious, but it truly is a programmable system that if you have a good single chain FV and the key is good, so sometimes it's you know, had to do some screening to find those that would have the required specificity, but once that's identified, then these particles can be highly selective in the way that they transduce cells and deliver their cargo. So that was really very exciting. So then using that strategy, uh, we wanted to test this in uh, a, a mouse model. And I'm gonna show you uh, one experiment that we published very recently demonstrating the potential of these types of particles for in vivo genome editing in a targeted fashion. So the experiment was done using humanized mice that have their own immune system ablated and they've been uh, transplanted with human immune cells, so human T and B cells that can uh, populate the animal and then be targeted in a system like this. And so the experiment was set up so that these EDVs were programmed to target human T cells in this type of a system and deliver a genome editor that would induce a, uh, the formation of a chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cell but in the body rather than ex vivo, which is the way these uh, CAR T cells are normally made today. And so I'm showing two uh, results of two different experiments with different numbers of animals. And I just want to draw your attention to, to a couple of things. So on the left-hand side is showing the in vivo CAR T cell generation. And so we can do this using a lentivirus. There we get uh, CAR T generation, but the integration of the chimeric antigen receptor sequence is random in those cells. It's not uh, being carried out uh, in a targeted fashion. On the far left is our buffer control. And then in the middle is the delivery of Cas9 EDVs. And what we were excited to see here is that we got production of CAR T cells in these animals, even though at lower efficiency than the lentivirus. But nonetheless, this was a, a first for sort of targeted in vivo genome editing. And when we analyzed those CAR T cells, we found that, that uh, at least in some cases, they were actually um, edited directly by Cas9. So this was an exciting moment in the lab to see that, uh, that uh, generation of in vivo CAR T cells using our, our delivery vehicles. Nonetheless, the efficiency, as you can see, is not high. And so what we've been working on since then is to really figure out how these EDVs are put together and how we can potentially make them even better in various ways. So this has taken us in some really interesting directions biologically, and I'm just gonna show you some of the experiments that are underway, uh, mostly by a, a relatively new postdoc, Wayne, and his colleague, another Wayne, a, a, a student, graduate student, working collaboratively with his lab of Randy Sheckman. So we've been trying to ask, you know, what, uh, what, these, what the structure of these EDVs is and how they're put together, and namely also how they assemble relative to lentivirus. And uh, my cartoon went by too fast, but basically we know that lentivirus starts off immature as immature particles, and then as the gag protein is cleaved, it's cleaved off of a polyprotein in that system, it assembles into the mature particles, and the gag protein forms, uh, part of the gag protein forms a capsid-like structure that encapsulates the lentiviral genome. That's how the virus normally works. And so one question we had about our EDVs was whether that same kind of maturation process is actually occurring. And so what I'm showing you here are some cryoelectron uh, tomograms collected by Wayne and Wayne looking at the different types of particles that we observe, both with lentivirus as a control 
and then with our programmed EDVs. And so if you just uh, look on the top and bottom, so the bottom is the lentiviral uh, samples. You can see immature particles on the left that look uh, kind of uh, spherical, and they we can see evidence of assembling proteins inside the, on the interior of the particle that ultimately move to the form shown in the center, the mature form, where we can see very clear capsid uh, cone structure that's made uh, when the virus matures. And, uh, and then, of course, always some particles that we can't quite uh, categorize. And very interestingly, we saw very similar types of particles when we looked at our EDV. So at least at a high level, these particles look like they're behaving similarly to what we would expect for lentivirus. Furthermore, we found that um, we could identify different kinds of capsid structures in these particles. If you could go to the next slide, please. Somehow my clicker is not really working very well, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, what we find is that if you look here, you can see a number of different kinds of structures, especially structures that have multiple different uh, capsids uh, that appear in the same particle. And so this sort of has raised the question, you know, do these, are these uh, particles functional? And ultimately, we started to wonder, is the capsid structure even necessary in our EDVs? It's clearly important for lentivirus because that capsid goes across the nuclear pore and delivers the viral genome into the nucleus. But in our case, we've got protein cargo that has its own nuclear localization signal engineered into it. So perhaps the capsid structure wasn't even necessary. It was a, a question that we had. So one of the things that Wayne and Wayne looked at, first of all, was just to ask whether the structure of the capsid proteins as they're assembling in these particles looks the same as we see in a lentivirus such as HIV. And so these are some preliminary reconstructions that Wayne has done in collaboration with Julia and uh, Evan Ogalis at Berkeley. And what we found was that these, these uh, assembling capsid structures inside our EDV particles look very, very similar to what you see in lentivirus. So uh, up until now, all of the, you know, sort of all of the data were suggesting that these particles are, are looking and assembling very similar to lentivirus. Uh, so we really want to do a functional experiment and ask, is this capsid structure important for the delivery of Cas9 in the context of EDVs? And so to do that, we took advantage of some compounds that have been developed as antiviral uh, compounds that disrupt the assembly or disassembly of the capsid. So this was our hypothesis, that maybe these EDVs actually don't need to mature. They don't need to form a full capsid uh, for delivery to work. And so I want to show you this experiment that we did. So we got two compounds. One of them is called lenacapavir, shown on the top, which is an approved drug for uh, treating HIV infection. And the compound on the bottom, PF74, is another compound, quite different uh, chemically. But both of these interact with the capsid structure. And on the top, in the case of lenacapavir, affect uh, the uh, disassembly of the capsid. And on the bottom, they affect the assembly. So it's kind of an opposite effect, but in either case, they're highly disruptive to uh, lentivirus, and you can see that in a dose-response kind of experiment that Wayne did, in either case, we get very rapid um, reduction of the ability of lentivirus to transduce cells, as monitored by looking at uh, luminescence in the cells. Amazingly, neither of these compounds has any effect on the ability of our EDVs to deliver Cas9 and to deliver it in a functional fashion because we're monitoring uh, luminescence, which is looking at uh, genome editing in this case. And so this tells us that the capsid structure, we think, is at least in the context of our particles, is literally not necessary for delivering Cas9 into the nucleus. And in data that I won't show you, we actually know that the uh, Cas9 protein is probably mostly located outside of that assembled capsid, and that's from some experiments that uh, graduate student Wayne has been doing uh, recently. So uh, why are we, again, why are we doing this? We're very excited about this because we think that by really understanding the structure of these EDVs and figuring out how they work and what's necessary for cell transduction and interaction, that we're going to uh, be able to reduce their complexity to a point where they resemble much more closely uh, a truly synthetic particle, like a lipid nanoparticle, except they will retain uh, the, the addressable, programmable properties that we love about these viral particles. So wouldn't it be amazing if we get, could get to a point 
where we have a stripped down particle that has the ability to transduce cells in a highly selective fashion like viruses do, but where we've been able to remove a lot of the machinery that we don't require for delivering this type of cargo such that you could assemble these particles in a cell-free fashion, much more similar to what's done with lipid uh, nanoparticles today. So that's, the, that's sort of where we're headed with this research. And so I want to just um, conclude. Oops. I'd love to con There we go. Uh, <laughs> I have to show you my conclusions. So I'll just summarize by saying that uh, we, we know from a lot of our analysis of different CRISPR-Cas enzymes now that the target search process in cells is really what's rate limiting. And being able to, for these proteins, to quickly find their target sequence and not get hung up with a lot of the, the, the non-target DNA in the cell is critical for their ability to function as good uh, genome editors. And, and so one of the things we're doing currently is assembling large uh, data sets of mutant forms of these, these uh, proteins that have different abilities of genome editing with the hopes of using ultimately data sets like that to train artificial intelligence or machine learning models so that we can predict enzymes that will be good editors and perhaps put their properties into the context of very small enzymes that where you can package even more of them in particles like EDVs. Um, we know that also having better, more efficient editors that are stable and w that uh, work with high efficiency per protein molecule mean that we can potentially reduce the cost of a therapy like this because we'll reduce the amount of an enzyme that's necessary for treatment. So that's another uh, motivation or sort of outcome of this work in the long term. As I told you, uh, these Cas9 EDVs enable cell type specific genome editing in vivo. We have an active collaboration with several labs at the University of California, San Francisco that are using these in different mouse models currently and getting some very exciting data. And uh, so stay tuned for that. It's, I think these particles are actually going to work incredibly well for in vivo editing, especially as we continue to improve their efficacy. And finally, we think that the composition of EDVs can ultimately be streamlined so that these particles look a lot more like lipid nanoparticles, but they retain the programmable properties of viral uh, compartments. And so I'll just uh, end there by thanking an amazing team in my group uh, shown here. So in, in our lab at Berkeley, we have uh, students ranging from postdoctoral scientists, uh, senior research scientists, graduate students, but also a lot of undergraduates. So every summer I have about 12 undergraduates uh, that are in this picture here that come to the lab and are able to work on projects that relate to, uh, you know, sort of genome editing writ large. So it's a real pleasure to have uh, an opportunity to work with so many talented people. And, of course, I want to thank the institutions that I'm involved with, thank, of course, the, the, uh, the funding agencies that have made it possible to do this research, including a huge thank you to the NIH, which has been supporting this work for, for a long, long time. And uh, with that, I'll stop, and I'd be, of course, delighted to take questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, there's, there's two microphones in the aisle. Um, I can imagine there's a few people here, and there might be a question. Um, I have one online until we get things going here. Um, the uh, DNA, I'm reading it, okay. So the DNA unwinding property of the wedge domain is very intriguing. Do other Cas9 proteins also have some capacity for the ATP independent DNA unwinding? I wonder if it may contribute to potentially global chromatin modifications of Cas9 overexpressing cells. Yeah, interesting question. So uh, there's, there's several, several components to that question. So he, I, this person is asking about the, the wedge domain and whether it's a general uh, property of other Cas enzymes, and the answer is yes. Uh, so, uh, we haven't been able to, we've tried a couple of other CRISPR-Cas proteins, in particular the spy Cas9 enzyme, which has a wedge domain, but it's so different than the ones found in the GEO and NME proteins that so far we haven't been able to translate our uh, mutations directly into that enzyme. Could this be affecting the behavior of, of Cas9 in a genome-wide context? I think was sort of yeah, the global global chromatin modifications. Uh, yeah. So how it, how it might affect its ability to make modifications more broadly? 
Um, I, think it's, I, I think it's likely to be very important. We're pretty excited about this discovery because we hadn't appreciated the importance of this particular part of the enzyme in DNA unwinding, which is truly fundamental to the way that these proteins operate. There's three over there, so let's go across the room. Green shirt, all of green shirt, there you go. That's you, yeah. Uh, hi, Jennifer, I'm uh, Sergei Shmakov from Eugene Schooling Lab. So it was really great talk, and it's really great to see how the crispr cas starting to save the lives. And uh, given the quite large variety of uh, all these RNA-guided uh, enzymes, and your experience uh, from in your experience from the start of this uh, CRISPR uh, development, uh, kind of uh, philosophical question. From a biochemical point of view, how do you see uh, these editors will look like in the uh, distant future, I don't know, 10, uh, 50 years? So fully uh, uh, matured and fully uh, adapted for the uh, work in uh, humans. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. I imagine that over time, I think what, what we'll see is that increasing um, numbers of these types of proteins will be developed for particular uses. So one of the things we're excited about with understanding the fundamentals of RNA-guided DNA recognition is that we think that's a principle that you can apply to lots of the kinds of tools that people are are developing with these enzymes that include making base-specific modifications, making uh, little insertions in the genome, maybe even large insertions into the genome in a targeted fashion. So I think that these, what we'll see over time, hard to predict, uh, I can't predict what will happen even next year, but you know, just thinking in the, over the next few years, I do think we will see uh, the toolbox continuing to expand, and especially as these enzymes start to be delivered with various in vivo uh, strategies, it will be very important to find proteins that are going to be very effective and, and um, you know, at the lowest concentrations possible. First, let me just uh, repeat the CME code before you start. The CME code is 50279. Uh, keeping in mind the improvements in the CRISPR in vivo delivery, what do you think about potential uh, cancer treatment based on using somatic mutation as targets for insertion of DNA in coding for peptides known to be uncongenic, for example, due to measles vaccination? Ooh, that was very hard for me to actually hear on this end. Do you want to repeat that question? Maybe, do you want to repeat it? To me? Typing something you else. You were typing something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Can you slowly please and maybe it? pull back from the mic a little bit. A little bit back? Yeah. Is it better? A little, little in between there. In between. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's it. Okay. That's Sweet spot. Good. So try me to repeat the question. Sorry for my accent. So keep in mind improvements in vivo delivery of CRISPR. What do you think about potential cancer treatment? which is using somatic mutation as targets for insertion of DNA sequencing in coding for immunogenic peptides, for, for example, due to uh, measles vaccinations. So I heard, what do I think about somatic mutations that are being used for? Targets for insertion of targets? For insertion DNA. For insertional immunogenesis to create immunity? Exactly. Um, maybe we should discuss that afterwards, because I, I have thoughts, but I, it's, it's, it's probably a longer conversation. Okay, I'll stop by. Thank you. So, congratulations for the pioneering work and finding out how the bacteria kills the virus and put it to work for people with, born with some genetic defects. So. Mother Nature usually recycles great system. So if the caspar crystalline system is so good for immune defense system for the bacteria, is there any remnant we have in the mammalian system that could help us in doing killings for all the viruses we are inhaling, eating, and drinking every day? 
So you're asking, could we transplant CRISPR-Cas as an immune system into our cells to work as an immune system? Yeah. No, I mean, do we have any of the similar system in mammalian system or multicellular organism? Naturally, not that we know of. <laughs> yeah, naturally, not that we know of. Um, but, uh, you know, it, I think one thing to keep in mind, this is, it's a speculation, but I think when you have a system like CRISPR that uses an RNA-guided mechanism for recognition of pathogens, the pathogens can evolve quickly if they're in a, you know, uh, in, a, in the context of cells that are replicating fast and phages, of course, uh, being produced in very high quantities. So there's a lot of active um, mutation that goes on, both in the CRISPR pathway itself and also in the, in the phages that are its target. So I just suspect that in a slower growing cell type like human cells, it might be very hard for the cell, cellularly encoded system, to keep up with the virus. A short question regarding delivery. What is the percentage of delivery with the single cell FB fragment? How much of it is targeted and how much of it reaches the target? Well, uh, yeah, it's a great question. So how much, you know, when you deliver a given amount of, say, these particles, how many of them actually get to target cells? It, we don't know for sure. We think it's probably very, very low percentage right now that are actually getting transduced. In T cells, you have a natural mechanism for the cells to be uh, dividing, and so there's an expansion of the edited cells that occurs over time, and we see evidence for that for sure. So doing this in immune cells is um, advantageous for that reason. I think ultimately when we want to be able to transduce other cell types in the body, we'll have to come up with much more efficient uh, delivery strategies, maybe even uh, strategies that do take advantage of self-replication in some way. Thank you. Dr. Downer, um, people are using CRISPR for a um, lot of unexpected applications like making caffeine-free caffeine coffee and spicy tomatoes. What, <clears throat> what are some of the, uh, these uh, sur surprising applications that, that you find perhaps the most unusual or unexpected? Uh, I think you're asking, sorry, it's a little hard to hear for some reason. Um, I think you're asking what are some of the unexpected applications of CRISPR that are happening right now. Well, I'll just mention a couple things that I'm actually quite excited about. One is, mon is manipulating microbiomes, so being able to make targeted changes in individual genes in individual uh, components of microbiomes, both in the human body but also in the environment. So this is a project we're working on right now at the Innovative Genomics Institute for both healthcare and climate uh, applications. Um, I also saw that, uh, you know, there, there are some uh, plant products that have been approved, like a CRISPR tomato that was approved in Japan. And uh, I'm actually currently in my garden growing a purple tomato that's also a CRISPR tomato. It has a <laughs> snapdragon gene in it. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are running out of time. Jordan, we're going to let you have the last word, and everybody else may be up during the reception, okay? Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come educate us on your research. Um, I'm not part of this field, so this may be a naive question, but I was curious if you've run into any other issues given the source of CRISPR, that it's from a prokaryotic cell, trying to apply it to a eukaryotic cell, if you've run into any issues uh, that speak to its evolutionary history. So you kind of talked about the magnesium concentration, for example. Was there any other uh, issues that you've ran into, and um, how can modeling or better uh, directed evolution help to overcome those issues? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's actually a great question. I think one of the things that comes to mind immediately is what about immunity, right? Do we, do we see an immune response to these proteins? And the answer is yes, although it's not clear yet whether that will actually be an issue clinically. If we're doing a one-and-done kind of delivery, as is currently being done for, uh, you know, sickle cell disease, and of course that's ex vivo as well, then I don't think it's an issue. But, you know, if you, were ima if you imagine a day when we're maybe delivering multiple uh, doses of a CRISPR-type therapy, then, you know, we have to th think about that. So I think ultimately having a lot of tools in the toolbox will be useful for the, in that regard, and also really understanding how these proteins are put together, what makes them tick so that we can engineer versions that will potentially have, you know, again, the properties that we want, such as avoiding immune recognition. 
Okay, with apologies, I'm going to have to call a halt. Uh, do join us for the very modest government sponsored uh, <laughs> cookies on the outside there. Uh, for those of you who had questions, maybe you sneak up to the front, though, uh, at the NIH library, and, uh, and, and Dr. Wada could uh, help you with those. Thanks so very much, everybody. Thank you all.